I think first up, I would say that the most obvious stumbling block is the National Party. And I know that's pretty typical coming from a Greens politician, somebody who would blame the opposition for all of those problems. There's no doubt the National Party have been in this electorate a hundred years. Uh, there's no doubt that they have established an economic uh, pattern, a, a way of being uh, in the electorate. They've, they've, they've largely driven the outcomes and the planning outcomes and the political outcomes in our community. I'm by no means wanting to bash the National Party. I'm just wanting to show a bigger picture here. Um, I'm an educated person. I'm a high school teacher. Uh, I was educated here at the Southern Cross University. Uh, I, I was educated, I have an arts degree. So I, I, feel, I feel like I've taken quite a lot of time in my life to be informed, uh, to be informed of the issues. And, and as Lorraine pointed out at the beginning, uh, when we think about the 2016 census data, uh, there were 72,000 people living in Coffs Harbour at the time. There were over 32,000 dwellings. And yet there's still a small proportion of the community that are affected by homelessness. Now, uh, if we extend that to Cowper, uh, in August last year, there was an ABC article that showed that Cowper is number one in New South Wales as a federal electorate, number one for dealing with social housing issues and uh, homelessness. Uh, in that article, it quoted uh, 4,400 people were waiting for housing or social housing, with 700 people uh, homeless. So that was in, uh, that was just last year in August 2020. So we have an issue, a growing issue, and uh, there was a report written last year um, by a firm called Equity Economics. And Equity Economics uh, believed in the Coffs Harbour Grafton area alone due to COVID-19 in particular, uh, and that is um, due underlying issues around employment because of COVID, our employment issues of uh, employment rate has gone up, that they were predicting a 30% increase in homelessness uh, f in the financial year leading up to uh, June 2021. So the issue is getting worse. As Lorraine said, and when she introduced me, I was, um, I guess, trying to give council a bit of a hard time around building a perimeter fence around their property, which is obviously an, uh, an important uh, debate when we talk about the security of uh, people who visit, work, or uh, attend those, 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 that, that premises or any premises that council has a duty of care for. But what it's also done is it's ignited a conversation and a debate around how we treat homelessness in our community and the stigma and the, pre and the prejudice that uh, so many in our community face if they're to slip between the cracks. And I argue, in a sense, what Dean was saying before, that um, the private market is going to solve the problem. It's not. I'm sorry. Nobody who does not have a job, let alone a fixed address, if they're couch surfing, are going to be able to go to their bank manager, even if they've been able to raise 20% of, of a mortgage deposit, are they going to then be able to afford the median house price in Coffs Harbour, which is $500,000? Forget it. These people are being forgotten. They're essentially being uh, left behind. One of the problems that poverty does is it entrenches poverty. So poverty begets poverty. If you're born into poverty, guess what? You'll probably end up being in poverty for the rest of your life. And that's data that's just been released this year through university studies. Uh, so we have a crisis. For any of you who have been to America where they don't have uh, welfare, access to, uh, to health care, you will, you will see the gap between the rich and the poor is extreme. Australia is heading in that direction. As a result of the um, 
the COVID-19 migration of people out of Sydney into the regional areas, Melinda Pavey, Minister for Housing, said this is a good problem to have. The Deputy Premier, not soon after, John Barillaro said, this is a champagne problem. Champagne meaning that if you sell your house for more money, you get to drink more champagne. It's a really, it's a, it's a, to me, it does not come across with the type of compassion, empathy, or understanding of the crisis or the problem full stop. Even our good uh, state member, Gurmesh Singh, uh, took to task council uh, only a week or two ago, blaming council, blaming council dean for not approving DAs or development applications fast enough. Uh, the director of community, uh, 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 Chris Chapman, shot back and he argued that yes, COVID had slowed down um, DAs during 2020, but since August 2020, uh, development approvals have actually risen 30%. It's a 10 year high. The council are doing everything they can through uh, the, 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 the situation that we have um, in terms of the economic paradigm that we live in. The Reserve Bank Governor, Philip Lowe, only in February, in response to the housing bubble, the emerging housing bubble, um, defended the Reserve Bank's decision not to rise interest rates to try and stop the, uh, the, the increase in house prices because they don't have any more levers in terms of managing the economy to stimulate growth. His belief is that there will be a uh, passing on of the money that is made from people selling their houses back in through to the economy, uh, also known as trickle-down economics. The effect, it's actually known as a term in economics called the wealth effect. Okay, this is the wealth effect, generically known as trickle-down economics, but it's known as the wealth effect, that you stimulate, you, you, you boost wealth, and that will then trickle down. What also can take place in a situation like this is what they call the negative wealth effect. And the, we and the negative wealth effect is when the gap between the rich and the poor get wider. And that's what we have seen. The trend between the wealth in this country has been growing for decades. It's not a, it's not a solution this group can solve, nor can counsel. But I'm here to also offer some, you know, what I believe are some simple steps forward that I think council can make in the interim. It'd be great if our federal government actually shifted completely in its economic management and, and came across terms such as the modern monetary theory, which allows the, uh, because the, the government is the, is, the, is the owner of our currency. We can print that currency. Print it until the cows come home. The only thing that changes is inflation. Yes, there's a risk there, but there are ways to manage that. There are ways to minute manage the, uh, the, the inflation in our economy so that it doesn't get out of control. What happens when you've got lots of cash is well, you can say, well, let's build social housing in Victoria. Victoria, Labor government, Dan Andrews. Dan Andrews is going to put up 16,000 social homes in the next four years, creating 10,000 jobs every year for four years. 16,000 homes. We've, we're confused in Australia. We're confused between the definition of what a house is and what a home is. We've lost our moral compass when it comes to families and what it means to raise children in our community. We've converted that to a commodity that can be bought and sold. And if you sell your house for a million dollars in Sydney, the average price of a house, you come to Coffs Harbour where you've got half a million dollars is the price of a house. Well, I might as well buy two. And because I've got equity, why not buy two more? Rent out three, 
on Airbnb, right? A few years ago, short-term rental vacancies in Coffs Harbour were around 12%. Today, they're around 0.5%. I mean, like, what are our state member and our federal counterparts doing about this? I mean, like, the statistics are there. I'm only a little bit educated, right? I'm only a little bit educated. I don't have all the answers, but sure enough, if I can come up with this and describe to you what I think is some of the underlying issues, what else is going on out there? So I'm passionate about this. I believe these are some of our big issues that we're facing, and I can guarantee you the crisis is not going away. Not only have we got an emerging and a growing and a booming and an attractive community that's just exploding in its population and the demand. You only have to look at Byron Bay where now the average price house is around one, or the, or the upper level, I, I think it's the average, I don't know, it's crazy if it is, but it's $1.3 million. Byron Bay is extreme and it's sad. So we don't have governments intervening in the market. We don't have the Reserve Bank. A great analogy of what the Reserve Bank should be doing is that at a party where there's a punch bowl and there's vodka in the punch and we like to party and get a little bit tipsy, well, just as the party's about to take off, the Reserve Bank should remove the punch bowl and take it away. Just as the party's... That's how the Reserve Bank should manage risk. Should just allow a little bit, then take it away. But what we've got right now is because interest rates are like 0.25% and because we don't have any wage growth in this country, we haven't had it in uh, 2000, the last 20 years in Australia hasn't grown. The uh, social security um, blanket that people um, depend on has barely risen, if at all, in that time as well. So even though there is a safety net, there is a social, uh, we do have some social welfare in this country. If it had been the government's will not that long ago, we probably would have lost Medicare as well. Unfortunately, the reality is we do have a Liberal National Party in power right now. They've been in power for a long time and they have held the balance of power more than the Labor Party. Greens have never held it. We always get chastised as being evil for some reason, but we've never held it. The opportunity for a reform of our economy has never been greater. And I haven't even mentioned climate change. So we have, hands down, a crisis that I don't even think we've seen the half of. Coffs Harbour's a beautiful place to live and it's growing. Council have got a massive responsibility, not only to protect and, 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 and uh, preserve why people want to live here, which is the pure reason is the biodiversity. Clean oceans, people love the beach. Crazy. We talk about just rolling out developments as if it's, it's nothing, and yet they're a massive footprint on the earth. Massive footprint when it comes to the uh, erosion of farmland, arable farmland, some of the best farmland in the world that grow some of the best crops, you know, the, your fruit crops that we could depend on for providing healthy, affordable food for our families is being instead rolled, I mean, transformed into uh, real estate to be, to be um, cemented over. So I'll get to questions in a minute. But what I feel like there's so many challenges, there's so many questions, and there's so much opportunity that we are just playing on the surface when it comes to the really serious issues. And they go back to the federal government, they go back to the US uh, politics, they go to China, they go everywhere. This is a global world now. We've got to start thinking as a global family. Our world is cracking apart. Our, our children do not have a viable future. By 2050, the, the, the temperature in this planet could have risen by three degrees by the end of this decade, by the end of this century, by six. You think a heat wave for an older person is a fun thing to experience. Imagine the type of storms that we can experience, the wildfires that we can experience, and then all of a sudden you're still living in your car, if, you, if cars even exist. Anyway, that was a, a brief unpacking of some of the things that I think about. 
In terms of solutions that I believe council can do, first and foremost, they need a homelessness strategy. They need to look at the cause and the issues that are affecting people. And it doesn't, I don't think, I don't think it costs a lot to come up with, you know, maybe 10 grand to come up with a decent strategy. Help the state government. They sound like they need it. They're confused, they're lost. They've been in power too long. That's my problem. I'm not trying to bash them. I'm just trying to say that there is a, they've just gotten too, too headstrong. They've, they're not necessarily understanding the underlying issues that potentially they've been a cause of. So we need a homelessness strategy because I feel like that will start to plan a, a way we can deal with this as a community. Uh, there are other options that I think council have and I believe that emergency shelter accommodation needs to be considered in that as well. The old courthouse. We've even got this wonderful fenced, protected and preserved community centre that may be able to provide overnight accommodation for people, particularly women. Particularly women, if, if, if the rates of homelessness for women are the, growing, the greatest cohort, and we, we know that there are many women in this community living in cars at the moment. So that's my second point, would be to make sure that council change their bylaws to allow people to live in their cars. Often the car is the very first uh, emergency shelter that a woman will take. If she's in a domestic violence situation or some other situation that demands um, her trying to feel safe and there is no available emergency shelter, then the car will be it. If she's got a car, right? If she has a car. So I think that there's an opportunity here for council to be able to designate particular council allotted pieces of land that potentially people, backpackers as well, people could go with their car and stay. Not a caravan park, because you can go to the caravan park over here and cost, it could cost you $50 a night. When I did the video over here about the fence, I went and spoke to homeless people, something I'm sure Mr. Singh hasn't done. I went over and I had a chat with them. I actually met three women in that process. Okay? Uh, there were two or three men as well. One of the men had just walked away from his family he actually was wearing like a rally shirt. He'd just come from work. He was really shaved. I'm looking at him. I had to double take, you know. And I said, so what's your story? Why are you here? And he goes, well, I've just walked away from my family. I left her with everything. And I'm just out here trying to start new again. I said, right, okay. So you're here though, you know, in the riverbed. And he goes, yeah, well, I went over to the caravan park, which um, council leased now to a private company. And it's, was he, he said to me it was $54 a night for him to pitch a tent. Can I get back to you in a second? Yes. I really want to press this point that we need to have a, a emergency shelter um, provisions in place because that's going to be the first safety net. Uh, Mission Australia, 41 beds. I went to their Mission Australia um, open day workshop and they said to me that out of that, 41 beds won't even touch the surface with regards to the waiting list, which is 10 years. Also, that Mission Australia is only transitional. So what happens is if you are leaving social housing and you've raised your family, you're in a three or four bedroom home, well, you can't, you know, it's in your home, it's your house and you've been there for 30 years, but you can't stay there. So this 41 bed is to take the, the couple the older couple potentially, and put them into that transitional accommodation until they can be shifted somewhere else. Then that housing can be freed up for another family. Smart idea. But we should, and yesterday, you know, I was on the, it was the, on the ABC, Melinda Pavey was on the ABC, and Fee Poole was said, you know, look, you know, so the only option we've got, the only option that the state government have is community housing. And Melinda's response was, well, until we get more money in the budget, that's right. So until the federal government give the state government more money, that's all they're going to get. The other, th the other side or the other problem is that where do state governments spend their money? And they do subsidise, you know, a whole lot of things I don't agree with. I won't 
go into it here. Dan Andrews has got a zero tolerance to homelessness in 5.2 billion. Yeah, so a lot of it's just the, it's just the goal set, the vision set, the, and the priorities and the desires and the, and, the, and the intentions, the priority of our state government. It's the priorities of our state government. And interesting, in, equi in the equity economics re re report, they questioned and even re and threw out the New South Wales Premier's priority goals for homelessness, which was to reduce ho street homelessness by 50% by 2025. They've said it can't happen. Cannot happen. Economics and priorities. Social housing should be the priority, but unfortunately, because of the neoliberal approach of the, 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 the Liberal National Party, they put all their faith in economists and in the market. It needs regulating. It need, we need to regulate homes, not, not laissez-faire economics when it comes to trying to solve this problem. Homelessness, people who are homeless are never going to be able to afford a house and they're going to be relying on good men like Dean Evers. Like community uh, not-for-profits like Mission Australia. What do we pay our taxes for? What do we pay our taxes for if it's not for public infrastructure and public good? The buildings, the, the, the actual buildings that they're building in Victoria are fantastic. They look amazing. Really snazzy, good design. They're going to be built quick and efficient. He's just going ahead. He's just going to nail it. And he will do it. This state government will never do it unless they are put under enormous pressure. So um, I think they are the main things that I can see council going ahead with. I think the final thing, and I, I, I hope you guys will get a chuckle out of this, but I think one of the other things that council could work on is a woman's shed. Oh, yes. yes. Right? That's community. 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 Relationships. Networks. We, the, the whole thing about neoliberalism, one of the, the, the guiding philosophies is individuality and, and hyper-individuality. Separate everybody into tiny little atomic units so they can go off shopping. That's the theory. Go shopping. Even this morning on the radio, they're talking about tourism. And he said, and one of the, the ministers is like, it should be a patriotic duty to go traveling in Australia and spend our money. Insane. These people, I just do not understand where they come from. They're, they're living in a bubble themselves. And they, the Canberra bubble does not understand the reality of, of where we are at today and what it means if you cannot live week to week, day to day, without knowing if you've got a shelter over your head, a kitchen to cook your food, your car has become your bedroom, your lounge room, and where you raise your children. It's ridiculous. And it's an embarrassment. I would not be a member of parliament knowing that there are people in my electorate with people living in their cars, struggling, raising kids, and with their pets. It's weird. I don't know how people do it. It's crazy. It's a, it's a mess. It's a flat-out mess. So I, I, I applaud Council for coming here today. I applaud Council for the limited amount of funds that they do have and the effort to try and build a civic space in a sense that's a, a really genuine attempt to provide public infrastructure that no private company is ever going to pay for. No private company is going to pay for a library or an art museum, I mean an art gallery or a museum. Right? We've, we've, we've got to really wake up to, I think, the realities that are at stake here. What would be great is if Gurmesh crossed the floor over this issue. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I'd like to say thank you very much to Jonathan. And I don't think I said it right. Yeah, thank you everybody. Thank you.